And the message today is entitled, Jesus' Formula for Healing. We're continuing in a series of studies based upon my book, Discover the Power Within You. And this today is the chapter on healing in the book of uh, the Insights into Jesus' Teaching. There's a great paradox of Christianity in that one-third of the gospel record of Jesus' ministry is devoted to work of healing and the discourses about his cures. And yet, healing by spiritual means has often been frowned upon by the very church that he set forth, which has looked upon the healing miracles as demonstrations of his divinity. You see, the early Christian theologians had a problem. On the one hand, there was the well-established religion of the Jews with the deep-seated commitment to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. On the other hand, there was the pagan world with its acceptance of many gods. So these Christian teachers did the only thing they knew to strengthen their claim. They made a God of Jesus. It was the key to theological strength but ultimate spiritual weakness. In the doctrine of the divinity of Jesus, there is no room for a healing principle. Jesus' miracles would be degraded if they were repeatable. So the rationalization was evolved and became a part of the fundamental theology that sickness is the will of God. Man must not question God's will. We hear much in the church of healing miracles as proof of Jesus' divinity. The word miracle, I think, needs to be redefined. Actually, the word doesn't appear in ancient manuscripts to describe the spiritual demonstrations at all. In the universe of law, there can be no such thing as a miracle in the dictionary sense of deviating from the laws of nature. If a healing takes place, no matter how unusual, law cannot have been transgressed. There simply must be more to the transcendence of life than we know about. Jesus said, I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Recall how he refused to test the power by throwing himself from the temple. Why? Well, obviously because he knew his power was not in changing law, but in his consciousness of working with law on a higher and higher level. Jesus was not a magician. He simply fulfilled the teachings of the prophets. The entire Bible is one grand testimony to the healing power of God. Jesus said, I know that his commandment is life eternal. In other words, he knew that man is an eternal being with the power of renewal as a part of his divinity. Healing is the law of life, not a deviation from it. He also said God is a God of the, not a God of the dead, but of the living. See, one of the great fallacies is the belief in the certainty of death. Science of medicine has been studied and researched for years in the milieu of death, actually using cadavers to study life. Today, it is generally known by a growing number of medical people and researchers that there's no such thing as death by natural causes. All death is accidental. There's no cycle in life that leads to sure decay. Spiritual healing is not an attempt to gain special favor with God or to abrogate the natural law. We do not use a different set of laws of spiritual healing than in medical or surgical healing. Life is the acting principle of being. Whether its energy is activated by meditation or medication, it really makes no difference. I know there are those who say, and have said to me, well, I don't go in for this spiritual healing business. When a person is sick, he should go to a doctor. And yet, there are many doctors who admit that a large percentage of the people that come for treatment are not organically ill, that their ills are emotionally induced, and their cure is more a matter of mental adjustment than physical treatment. And there are quite a number of ministers who resist the idea of spiritual healing. I heard one of them say some time ago, God is to be worshipped, not to be used. He is not to be used for selfish purposes, such as healing. Well, this would certainly imply that God has no interest in life or healing, that his only interest is in the church, that he's interested in theology, but not reality, in congregations, but not people. Obviously, this indicates an attitude that life and health are something that exists outside of God, that spiritual healing is degrading to God, almost like asking God to help, help you pick a winner at the track. Now, a study of the so-called healing miracles of Jesus indicates some key ideas that undoubtedly played an important part in the ultimate demonstrations. And together, they form a formula for healing. And we're going to consider a few of them, and then we'll pull the whole thing together in a special treatment that we can use for you. First of all, Jesus said, Judge not according to appearances, but judge righteous judgment. Jesus taught that man lives in two worlds, not in succession, but concurrently. 
He lives in the world of appearances, of sickness and health, of peace and war, of harmony and chaos. But at the same time, he lives in a world of spirit. He called it the kingdom of heaven, a transcendent realization of life. In the spiritual world, you are whole no matter what the outer experience reflects. In the kingdom within, there can never be lack or inharmony or sickness or death, no matter what you ultimately may experience. So he says, don't let yourself stop short in appraising your life. You are whole even if you don't know it. And you can be healed because you are whole. In other words, we are asleep to our wholeness. As Wordsworth says, our birth is but a sleep and a forgetting. And that's the key to demonstration of healing, is awake and remember. Awake to the realization of what you really are. Remember the truth about yourself and deal with yourself on a higher and higher level. And he says to the, in healing the paralytic in the ninth chapter of Matthew, be of good cheer, thy sins are forgiven you. See, the Bible clearly emphasizes sin as the cause of disease and the overcoming of sin through salvation of the soul as a means of physical redemption. Of course, the word sin means to be redefined. Sin and salvation are theological terms that have been far removed from the idea of spiritual healing. But you see, with Jesus, forgiveness was the foundation. He says, thy sins are forgiven. Go and sin no more. Sin is basically the frustration of the divine flow within the individual. And it's our frustration. It's in our consciousness. A mental block. The mental pro process by which we stray away from the centered flow of oneness. And this separation causes decay and disease and inharmony and death. As Paul says, the wages of sin is death. A break in the circuit forecloses life. A plant cut off from the source fades and dies. And as we're told, the prodigal son goes out into the far country and he came to no one. Ultimately, it says, Jesus says, draw nigh unto God and he will draw nigh unto you. And how do you do this? On well, the prodigal son simply came to himself. In other words, wake up from your dream sleep. Awake and realize who you are. And the moment you step out of the thought of limitation, you step into the light of wholeness. And as the Bible says, then shall thy light break forth as the morning and thy health shall spring forth speedily. In another instance, when Jesus was healing the leper in the 8th chapter of Matthew, he, the person says, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Jesus almost sternly, in a feigned rebuke of the man, says, I will be thou made clean. I will be thou made clean. In other words, he's emphasizing here, God's will is for good. God wills health. God could not be the author of sickness or affliction of any kind. If God were the author of the limitation, then no one, not even Jesus, would have been able to heal the sick. The limited will of God has been a fixation in Christian preaching. I've heard a preacher say, Your illness, dearly beloved, is your blessed privilege. There's no other way to heaven except your suffering. So accept it now. This is your duty. But Ezekiel in the Old Testament says, Why will you die? For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live. You see, every person, and that means you, has the built-in capacity for health. It is the normal condition of life, a condition that is true to the reality of your being. How important it is that we begin to get this consciousness and work with it. Certainly this was the key to Jesus' healing miracles. If health is not God's will, then no amount of prayer will help you. No amount of prayer will suspend the law of gravity. There's no reason to pray unless you believe it's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. When prayer is answered, what happens may appear to be miraculous. Actually, it has come about as normally as the growth of a flower. Is it a miracle when you open a window and let in the light? Growth is a good description because life is forever growing, forever unfolding. We may be limited in our consciousness of time. Jesus said, lift up your eyes, the fields are now white unto harvest. So all healing is a part of an orderly process of cell renewal, but the levels of consciousness may transcend time-bound experience. So a month of healing growth may happen in a flash and therefore appear to be the healing miracle. And there's another insight that Jesus gives to the man with the withered hand in the 12th chapter of Matthew. He says to him, stretch forth thy hand. Stretch forth thy hand. And the key here is go first to God and go next to man as and if God directs. There may be something for you to do, as the Quakers say, move your feet. 
Expect to be guided as to the outer means. There may be the need, for instance, for a change in your diet, for increased exercise, for adjustment of something in your relationships or your affairs. But stretch forth your hand. There's an old Jewish legend that expresses the thought vividly that faith cannot be passive, but must be the expression of genuine inner activity. It tells the story that when Moses threw the wand into the Red Sea, the sea, contrary to the expected miracle, did not divide itself to leave a dry passage to cross. To cross. Not until the last man had jumped into the sea did then the waves recede and the tides move backwards and the experience of, of a pathway across the Red Sea manifest. Your healing, uh, miracle of healing can come to you, but be very sure that you're not simply waiting for the water to part. You are now a spiritual being. Jump into the stream and know it. Act as if you were already whole. Believe that you have received and you shall receive. Now, there are a number of other instances where these ideals of Jesus are put together into what I call a formula for healing. We don't have the time for them. If you're interested, you can read my chapter in the book, Discover the Power Within You. But we're going to pull together the concepts sharing that we've shared and a few others too, which give, give some of Jesus' insights that lead to the demonstrations in his experience, and that create a spiritual realization that makes a powerful spiritual treatment. And I would like to use it for you right now. So just be still and let the words take root into your consciousness. Regardless of appearances, you now see yourself as a child of God. You accept the forgiving love of the Father and forsake all negative beliefs that do not square with the omnipresence of God's perfect life. You know that God's will is for health and healing, that his healing law is working in and through you right now. With all your heart, you now seek to let God's perfect will for health be done in you right now. You have no fear, for you know that you are not alone. You have faith in God and in his healing presence. And you know you are now healed. Praise God. Praise God. You know that infinite intelligence now puts words in your mouth, guides your hands, and directs your footsteps in the way you should go to manifest and sustain the perfect, vitalizing health of mind and body.